before this, I looked up uh, our stuff in Georgia early and I went back and read the books that I've got of yours on my shelf. And I just felt like really grateful that you would take the time to talk about my book and stuff. It really means a lot to me with the respect everyone has for your work and, and how long we've known each other. You know, I think I asked you to do an event for the first time, like 2011 or something. Right. No, I was I was trying to think back on that as well. And uh, also that I think it was maybe maybe around about 2011 because I'd been to a performance of yours before um before I met you um if that's not a kind of meeting already I also had um been studying just around the corner from the British Museum and I'm almost sure although it could be a dream visited upon me that there was a fire alarm that went off and you were one of the guards that was very gently just gesturing towards um the fire escapes and we all filed out um and I I don't make it a habit of just staring at people that um, are in that position in, in galleries, but you had such a sense of poise about you. And because I knew that the uh, performance that I'd seen previously, it was very poised, but also very energetic and full of kind of a, a freneticism. Um, and reading your text now, your brilliant novella now, and holding these two images in my mind, it's, it's difficult to dispel, dispel those images um, of you, the author, who I, you know, one is supposed to pretend has just been parachuted out of, of the text necessarily and, and see through a prism of their characters. But we'll talk about all that, that later. But I, I, it is a privilege to have read the book and to be able to, to um, force people to read it <laughs> as much as possible. Um, I, I know at our last meeting as well, you were saying about writing of it and and prose in a sustained form and the difference that was to write rather than maybe your experiences of ascetic writing and of poetry um and i i do wonder how you now read it as a text um with those memories of how it came to be i think genuinely not to be modest but when for example, you, I, and Luke Kennard went away together, and I've had long conversations with Luke, and I've, I've had small conversations with you about about the process of writing prose next to poetry, obviously with both of you being like really deep in the methodologies and modes of both. And um, writing prose, especially prose that essentially I began while working at the museum and then revisited over different times over the last kind of decade, it's quite aberrant and quite strange. I really had a go, maybe five years ago, of, of creating a body of work that was fiction, which remains in tatters. And the reason why I couldn't finish it and get to it was because genuinely I couldn't stay indoors for months on end and work at it. And I think that's something not a lot of people talk about very much, is the discipline of being able to spend your working hours, the, the hours of daylight, inside and generating eight hours worth of work that you discard some and work over others. And with this book, it was slightly different, but the process that was really, really difficult was the editorial process. It seems like from reading your work that you're very, very good at editing. I wonder how you find it. Do you find editing okay? Because I found it incredibly difficult to edit the book. Um, I found editing, it, it actually feels something that that I can rely on as almost a coming down process. So, um, I have a sense of whether I want it to be uh, an elegant sentence, so I have to be careful with, with commas and full stops and kind of standard punctuation, or whether I want there to be um, a, a percussive kind of methods to, to the arrangement. So that to me actually feels like a kind of calming mechanism and something to not look forward to, but um, part of the process that I will know that the time I put into it, something beneficial for the text will come out of it. Um, and I think for that reason, when I was rereading your novella, um, those moments where the voice drops vowels or, or drops a, a certain kind of um, stylistic method that the read has become uh, familiar with and, and it then becomes jagged and glitched. I wondered about the, the editing of that, whether that was always going to be the case or whether that was extant from uh, the first draft. How did you regulate that? Or was that uh, something earned or born out in, in the editing process for you? I think the reason why this um, novella is quite unique to me as something to look back on or read back on is because it is made of various processes which is quite unusual 
Um, and the way you describe editing there, you almost use compositional language, um, which I, I'm very attracted to, especially with poetry and especially with film. When I work with film or with sound or with poetry, that is exactly how I feel. But the actual practical size of prose requires a great deal of patience. And you kindly mentioned before that a lot of people reference my energy, and that's something that I cultivate in my lifestyle, in my approach, that energy. But the downside of that is a kind of impatience, right? And again, this is something, you know, we both teach. And I, I say that all the time to students through knowing my own fault. Like, you have to be a very patient editor with yourself. You have to ask other people's opinions. And so this was a completely unique process because I'm not good at editing because I'm highly impatient. And this book was made in different modes. So the first draft was incredibly experimental. It was basically pretty much all written like the central chapter where the characters in the the reading room, uh, not called the reading room, but the reading room in real life, which is based on my real experiences. When I started at the British Museum, I was working inside the first Emperor exhibition inside of the reading room, checking fire exits, which obviously are these hallowed literary places that no one gets to go now. And I got to go to kick open fire exits. And those experiences were quite hallucinogenic. And the whole novella in its first draft was incredibly, you know, people would say modernist, wouldn't they, Jussian or something deliberately misspelled and, and chalked up and over the years i made it more and more and more readable and that's another interesting thing that it's because it's prose and because i don't have expertise in prose through lack of experience i actually wanted to make it so that people could read a lot of it um and therefore the editorial process again was so important and i found that very very challenging because i felt like i had good material but how to make that material its best form that's such a big thing and i don't hear a lot of people talking about it so when I've looked at your work or, or Luke's work or other prose poet um, stylists that I admire, I look at it, I look, oh, I think I can see the edit there. I think you can see draft number nine. <laughs> and it's not something that people talk about a lot. I mean, it's, it's interesting in terms of the themes that are embedded and demonstrated in, in reading the text, this idea of the fire escape, the idea of something accessible but also forbidden but also necessary and the staging of access to that um the the way that you're describing an editing process or an accessibility that the reader might have to the text versus what might be um i don't know off-putting or, or abrasively other to an experience of, of reading um there's so much in the novella about this impulse to have activity or to disrupt set against enforced stasis or positions of authority that are to do with surveillance and a main maintenance of, um, of an authority kind of being more important than the authority itself. Um, and I wondered whether... Uh, almost, would you call it him uh, a narrator or a protagonist, um, the central figure? Um, did you feel that his story existed in the first instance in that, that central chapter, that, that uh, what existed in some form as a, as a central short story that I know was shortlisted for the, for the White Review Prize, um, whether the story started there and bloomed outwards or did you feel that in writing that you were revealing stages of what would become a, a later narrative that it could slot into? I think that my, my, my recollection of it is actually quite hazy to a certain extent, but I think practically a lot of the novella was like that. And then I'd sent a chunk of it and pretended it was a short story. <laughs> um, and it got, you know, noticed kindly by the White Review. And then <clears throat> going back to it, I realized that there's a big question about e experimentation and methodology over 11 years or 10 years of writing poetry that I've realized so much of what, say, someone who's called experimental or whatever the word means or innovative, it becomes a new kind of bracket. And I try to break out of that halfway through my publishing collections by writing things which were more um, literary, shall we say, high literary, Eastern European influence poetry. And I know a lot of people who are interested in experimental poetry looked at that when I published it and were like, why are you doing that? You know, why is this not another chaotic collection about this or that or another experimental thing? And I think that's what's happened with this novella is that sometimes we get fixed into our styles and, and we become that thing and we're expected to do that thing. And it, and it is true. A lot of very successful poets and writers basically write the exact same method with different content for their entire lives. 
And what essentially happened with Muiem is that this place that I'm in, in the last couple of years when I've been trying to turn it into something that would come out into the world, I look back at the aberration and the intensity of it, and I just felt instinctually it's not what I want to do with it, you know, that it, it would be an exercise in people opening it up and going, oh, interesting word salad. And so what's <laughs> left, which is a, true of a lot of my poetry for reasons that are, are, are vital, but at this point in my life, I feel like with prose, because I don't know enough about how to write it well from experience, um, and I, I do believe that we accrue experience how we accrue expertise through experience. That's the only way that we gain that. And, and with poetry, I do so much of it that I feel confident with that with prose. I came back to this material that was so aberrant and crazed from my time, writing it on the galleries by hand in pencil on pieces of paper and then typing it up later and having sent out that chapter and it being nicely recognized. I thought, you know what, I'm going to start shaping this novella around that because it exists outside in the world. Uh, and I'd also published one of the chapters, the, the kind of most depressing chapter that I could possibly, I can't believe it when I read it now, the kind of <laughs> without spoilers torture scene. I don't know what, why I'm so miserable in my writing and, and hopefully not in my life. Um, that had also been sent out. And so I thought, oh, those two may, must remain. But I cut so much of it and I really wanted it to be a novella. I wanted it to be quick uh, so I could control it, so I could make it more readable, so I could make it elusive. And so that I could contain within it the things you kindly referenced before, you know, the, the high and the low. I wanted it to feel like it was talking to European literary um, ideas, but also talking to like pulp and Warhammer and science fiction and apocalypse, Lovecraftian stuff. And I wanted it to talk about work and hierarchies and the idea between the worker and the visitor, the transitory and the permanent, the stasis, the boredom. The, the, the negative feelings that come from not being valued in your environment, the sense of like lurking threat in work um, and all these things. But I wanted it to be fleeting because um, the museum itself within the story is, is, is kind of paper mache, right? You know, the idea is that the museum is so permanent in people's minds and it was so permanent when I worked there, but I wanted the novella to feel like, is this even real? Is it like a set? You know, so that's why the styles were that way. That's why the length was that way. And that's why I think I made it more readable to make it structurally so that people could find their way through it. And then in that core is this remaining modernist hallucination, which is, I suppose, the style in which it was born. I mean, thinking there about combinations of, of high and low or expectations of that, um, the idea of the fleeting as well as influence, um, I mean, high and low, there's there's a quotation which I've only ever found via things like quotefancy.com or A to Z <laughs> of quotes rather than the original text, but this quotation that is attributed to Gertrude Stein that is, when in a museum, walk slowly, but keep walking. And this idea of the the vitrine or the artifact as something that you're, you're meant to um, acknowledge and recognise as a visitor, um, but the guard is also guarding, but you're meant to walk past it. It's, it's as you say, this, this fleeting encounter with, um, with history without that being um, a logical impossibility where we all just, our heads explode if, if attempting that. And I think that what you're describing with the novella form is the, the perfect craft and a very thoughtful, considered craft for looking at what a museum is and what occupants, inhabitants, controllers controlling forces or the controlled within that space can can be and and do um and it strikes me therefore that also talking about the, the, the violence within that space and within your text but also the humor that either comes with that violence but is is also as part of the staging just threaded through um all of uh, of the novella where we feel both the the violent charge and and the erotic charge within the humor of these characters or the, the moments of of awful terrible humor of these characters poised to enact what their desire or uh, a sense of control or loss of control um and i wondered whether that was something either part of the, the spontaneity of writing or, or the opposite of spontaneity with editing, um, is that something that you felt you had to add in or was it always just part of the, the architecture or the style or the sophistication of, of the writing there? I wonder what, where humour situates itself for you or where you situate yourself with humour with the, with the writing. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think you've hit on some incredibly important points there because 
the answer really is that it comes actually from the experience of working there for seven years you know that there are things in it which are completely structurally superimposed from from reading and from copying better writers but the actual experience of working at the museum the thought exercise that i've used especially recently when friends have read the novella and asked me about how it relates to my time working there and you kindly mentioned before perhaps seeing me as a guard you know so many people who i've met through poetry and writing sometimes would come through the museum and bump into me and see me in my uniform and, and the two things that i always say to them and, and the the thought exercise is imagine visiting your favorite museum and then you have to stay there 48 hours a week for seven years you know it, there's something about it i mean i'm very grateful for that job it literally i didn't write a poetry before that job it, it gave me so much in my life i, I love that place and i love the job but the two things it does to you one time you have to sit in the same space for three hours, often seven times a week. So time completely contracts and expands, which is pace, which is what you were so um, kindly noticing in, in the novella. Like pace, I really wanted the idea of, of, of time and pace to shift because the visitors are always moving and you're st still, you know, it was, it's actually a very real feeling and a phenomenon of being sat in a chair and watching thousands, you know, they... At, when I was working there, it was 25,000 visitors a day for a building built to house a couple of hundred, really. Um, and so you have this complete feeling that you're lost in time. People come up to you and ask you a question. You'd have to click back into their temporal reality. And it, and that really affected my colleagues um, in a very, very strong way. And I would notice that and try and defend against it myself. And the other is a kind of, I always got really frustrated because I always tried to criticize um, a lot of the like base postmodern ideas like Baudrillard or something, you know, you want to like make Baudrillard like, I don't know, Ginsburg or Bukowski when you're like six, for 16 year olds, but then you work at the museum, you're like, oh my God, the <laughs> idea of subreality, you know, unfortunately Baudrillard seems to be like, he's not just an 80s superstar. People taking pictures and not looking, you know, not, that's not something they have occasionally, like 90% of people just click, click, click. And you're like, the excess creates a question about whether anything is real. So people's experiences at the British Museum, I think, a great deal is one hour whizzing around the history of the world, taking pictures of things they're not looking at and popping out and getting to the next thing. And that that's really, <laughs> that's really interesting. And I wanted to capture that a little bit. And, and in capturing that, the natural inclination when you really have done, um, you know, 48 hours, set, there were six day weeks often, you do that for seven weeks. At the end of that, the natural inclination is the feeling of insurrection. Like this has got a breakdown. This, at some point, someone has got to push one of these things over, and then I grab them, and then they grab me, and 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 in that too, then is obviously the the kind of gallows humour. I mean, you can imagine what it does to some of the people, and the workforce at the museum was like fifty five year old union cockneys and like twenty five year old uh, hipster dweebs, <laughs> and so the conversations and the humor of the people and some of the things the visitors would do it was very very funny while being also very very slow and and i really wanted to capture that because i knew i had a perspective that most people probably wouldn't i think that definitely comes across and, and the idea of novella and this novella as as the grab and also a release i think that for me as a reader the way that you've ended the novella how do i stage this without without spoiling it but there is a release there to do with the unwatchable realities or imagined potential realities um, of the unsurveyed or unsurviled object. Um, and that does provide narrative momentum and a narrative shift. Um, but it doesn't feel as a, as a total text like you required neatness there that there is still this chaos and the the chaotic energy um so it, it just as as an arc and a, and a narrative structure it, it is a very generous statement i think by by the author um and i wondered whether thinking about you, you spoke about the workforce and i know that previously you've you've collaborated with um artists uh it was one alexander l is that right um yes in terms of the the museum of doubt um and i wondered whether what you do so much as uh both an uh, a writer an artist um and a curator is 
based on or premised by an appreciation for, appreciation for what collaboration can do. Um, I wondered whether you as a curator and collaborator um, in so much of, of your work and, and, and your life, um, did you feel that thematically how the curating body or the character of the curator might be styled in the novella felt at odds with that, uh, with those impulses and those energies? Or did it feel um, it might be at odds, but that's part of the complexity of what curational work is or could be? I think that's an amazing question. Yeah, I think because I don't see myself as a curator, but I do see myself as an organiser or, or something like that. I, what I did witness at the museum is the kind of lofty power of the curator, maybe the last vestiges of a kind of different idea of, you know, intellectual power and the shaping of culture for the people to engage in. Um, and the ending and the beginning kind of speak to that too, how transitory that is, how generational that is. Um, and the ending and the beginning also, they come from one of the exhibitions I worked in a lot, which was Pitch Black, was Pompeii. Um, and, and as parts of the text of the ending and the beginning are actually taken from accounts of Pompeii and this idea of like, you know, what do we need this for? What do we need this repository of history and knowledge for? What is it actually doing? How transitory is it? Um, does the museum then speak back to people's pace of moving through it eventually by collapsing, crushing and growing again and all these different ideas of the cosmos in the same way that the very depressing torture based scene is about, oh, you want history, but you don't really want you don't really want to talk about actually what it's like, you know, to look at history and to feel the burden of people's pain and suffering. It's almost an overwhelming thing to do. The museum has to somehow show it without showing it. Um, certainly what I did realise at the museum, because I started organising events while I was writing this, while I was working there, is that the the subtle and the invisible is like a huge part of that job. Like I always say, um, like a boxing referee, you shouldn't be seen if you're doing a good job. And you would feel that with some of the curators. Um, and I think that's what the character is supposed to resemble, is someone who has the appearance of deliberately trying to be seen and tr trying to be in control and therefore isn't genuine. It's some commentary on the idea that if you do organise things that benefit other people, then you have to be very careful where your place is in that. And, and without being banal or waffling, all of my performances at events that I organise are comedic. I've learned over the years to, you know, to do that and to create space and these things like that. And that's definitely a space where I kind of learned that and saw that because you would see some amazing curators in that place. I mean, some of them are very famous Irving Finkel and people like that who were so nice and so interesting and create these amazing repositories of knowledge and disappear and then others that would literally come up to you and say, you know, you're a pleb <laughs> or something like that. I mean, I wondered, thinking about, about the beginnings and endings, um, I asked in, in an email prior to this conversation, like, were there any texts that you would want me to, to particularly be aware of and uh, or images and you very kindly uh, stated some and very kindly said probably it might be a, a lot for you to get through before Wednesday um, but I noticed that two that you stated are, are used um, at, uh, are quoted at the start of, of the novella um, and just making sure I'm not going to miss um, attribute them but um, in particular the one that mentions um, let me see here the Gombrowitz one, um, and yet this drowning in space was accompanied by an extraordinary rise of the concrete. Concrete, We were in the cosmos, but as though we were in something terrifyingly definite, determined in every detail. Um, again, I think it strikes me that uh, the form of a printed text rather than a performance or a recording that, that might be reframed in certain ways, there is a definiteness, definiteness to it. Um, it exists in the reader's hand, although within its infinite kaleidoscopic ways in which it can be read or misread or reread, um, a final form to it. Uh, quite apart from, from the editing process and the required isolation or, or sustaining of patience with the text, does it feel like a complete and finished thing to you or does it feel like it's part of a continuing process or the continuum of your ongoing work um does it feel alone or standalone to you i suppose 
It does feel quite standalone. It's, that's an amazing question. Yeah, um, probably because of your own experience of publishing short fiction, uh, extended prose and poetry and performing yourself, you know, that range of things is your own expertise has, it has probably led you to that insight. Yeah, it does feel completely standalone. You know, for years I, I looked at prose, I won't over-exaggerate this, but almost like the way some people look at a PhD, like it'll save me. You know, I don't want to overstate that, but, you know, there's a market and, and we can't pretend that there isn't. And over the years, <laughs> over the years, that has really been challenged by my experience of, of what fiction is and the way it's sold and the way people engage with it. And also some of the people, especially when I went to bigger festivals who were fiction writers, mm. the way it seemed to affect them, um, the, just the process, I think, of staying in all day. And so over the years, I gave up deliberately and I was like, no, I'm not doing this. This is almost like you know, the leveling up that a lot of people do. And I felt like I'll do it if, if I feel it, you know, I'll do it if it's the right thing to do. I, Cause you get, you, you do want more repute sometimes you do want more engagement. You do want to engage in a market. You do want to pursue these things. Um, it would be a fascinating conversation to speak to you about that, but I, I won't put you on the spot here. And so for me anyway, this is coming back to something and it's really because of, um, Dominic and Tenement, it's like the right person to help me realize this into the world at the right time to visit it when I don't, I'm not writing fiction or playing with prose or creating this final finished object because I'm trying to do something. It's just because the text is there and it's the right time because of the lockdown, because of having the time. So it, because of that, um, and again, such an insightful question, it does feel completely separate from the continuation I've tried to do, especially the collections I've done in the last three or four years. I see them as um, as being often twins or, or trilogies conceptually and structurally, and, and people who are kind enough to see them can see that, can feel that. This sits apart, um, and I hope something will come to to follow it in fiction and prose but i at the moment i have no plans for that and no desire so it might just be something that sits separate and um is a legacy also of returning to something i used to do a very long time ago and maybe that's why it happened because i don't know if this happened to you but in the lockdown i, I looked back over what i'd done and tried to ask myself the question of whether i was on the right path and whether i wanted to keep doing it and the product of that question is perhaps this novella i think that's great and and it it really does exist kind of, I want to say, as a rip-roaring read. Like it really is very enjoyable to read and moving and compelling. And uh, and it feels monumental in, in that sense of importance, justified importance to it as a text. But I suppose the word standalone came to me because it, it feels like it has its own context. It provides its own context. It illuminates where it is doing what it does. Um and I think it also feels like a testament, not necessarily to to quarantine or to the last couple of years related to the pandemic, but to this idea of, of the visitor and to visitations and to a studied time spent with a thing um, in both the negative and, and positive senses. Um, and as I say, it just felt like a real privilege to read it. And it feels like a very important text. Um, so thank you for, for writing it and, and so having that patience with it. Thank you. I think uh, um, it's you know, very much for this reader. Sorry. Um, you know, with your amazing work that uh, none of us have sight to our own creations, right? They exist and we don't really know what they are and other people kind of tell us and I have no relationship to anything I've ever finished. So just to have your time on it and to have Dominic's support in publishing it, it's like a, it's an amazing bolt and it's personal. People never talk about that too. Like these things don't exist objectively. To me, I have no sense of what people feel when they read anything I ever do. But to have some feedback from the, the universe is really, really lovely and personal. So it's especially kind of you to take the time to read it, let alone to chat to me about it. So I'm really grateful. Gratitude is all mine. Thank you. <laughs>